This week's topic is blood sugar, specifically blood sugar monitoring using a continuous glucose monitor. And historically, if you've heard of these, uh, they're used for diabetics, uh, especially type one diabetics, so that they uh, have continuous monitoring of their glucose and know when to dose insulin. And you can even sync them with your insulin pumps so that the the pump can automatically uh, dose you per your CGM or continuous glucose monitor. But um, and so the you know the usefulness for diabetic patients is well established, and we can talk about that further if you like. But my interest in covering the topic today is for non-diabetics and the usefulness for anybody who's interested in understanding their blood sugar. And again, you don't have to be diabetic and you might not be interested in your blood sugar uh, as it relates to diet, because you may, you know, you may think you eat a good diet or you may actually eat a good diet and your blood sugar is not an issue that way, but you may be an avid exerciser and be interested in understanding how your exercise impacts your blood sugar and how maybe exercising fasted versus fed impacts your blood sugar. You may be interested in how your stress impacts your blood sugar or your sleep. So there's many uses for continuous glucose monitors outside uh, and helping you understand the impact of multiple lifestyle factors outside of just the carbs you eat. So um, I personally have been wearing one. Now I'm on day four. And it's been interesting for me uh, just to to see how the the different things I do impact my blood sugars. And uh, let's jump over to a whiteboard so we can draw some things. Okay, so I've been wearing a, a continuous glucose monitor for four days now. And I've been using one called the Dexcom 6. And there's multiple out there. Some are prescription only. Some you can get uh, online. And so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, and it doesn't really matter, you know, whether it's De Dexcom or NutriSense or whichever one you're wearing, as long as they're, you know, validated and, and um, accurate. What's more inter uh, important once you've got a validated accurate one is to observe how different things impact your blood sugar. So uh, we can look at diet. You can look at your exercise. You can look at your sleep. And you can look at your stress as a few factors that will impact your blood sugar. And so the diet's the most intuitive one because obviously your diet impacts your blood sugar. And so um, the continuous glucose monitor will show you, will do exactly what it sounds. It's continually measuring your glucose. How is it doing that? Well, instead of uh, in the past where you would have to prick your finger every time you wanted to know what your glucose is in real time, with the CGM, it uh, it's literally uh, basically implanted in you or on you so that you have a little microfilament that's uh, inserted into the capillary and monitoring your blood glucose in real time in the capillaries 24-7. Uh, and so this is a good way to see where you at. Now, the, the booklets say don't treat yourself based on your CGM. If you're a for example, if you're a, a true diabetic, they say um, you don't want to make a treatment decision based solely on the CGM. If if your CGM alerts you that your blood sugar is too high or too low, say, then what they recommend is to then prick your finger because that's more accurate than the CGM in real time. And if if they're aligned, then yes, you know, use your insulin or get sugar depending on if you're too high or too low. So what I found is with, with the CGM, you can set your own ranges. So you can set highs and you can set lows and it'll alert you if you go too high or too low below what you've set. So for me personally, I made 180 as my high and I made 
uh, 70 as my low. And um, that the natural kind of rhythm of what it should look like if we've got time down here on the X axis and we said, let's put 180 here and 70 here. So 70 would be the low floor and 180 would be the ceiling. And then below 70, you know, you'd be in the red area. We don't want to be in the red and we don't want to be in the red above 180. So if you're doing a good job, you know, your blood sugar in real time is going to be like this and it might do this and it might do this just over your day. Okay. And when you're looking at how does a meal impact you, you're looking at after you eat a one to two hour window after your meal, how did that impact your blood sugar? Okay. So you, you, right when you put the food in your mouth, if you're watching your blood sugar, it's not, it's not going to change necessarily right away, but within the hour, it should change. Um, and so what you want to know is what's your blood sugar between one and two hours after you ate. And when you observe that, you want to know what's the absolute peak that it reaches, because that's important. So that would be the glycemic kind of uh, impact of the meal. But then you also want to know uh, the, the slope, so to speak, or the area under the curve for how long does it take, you know, if the slope is like this, how long does it take for your blood sugar to come back down to the baseline that it was pre-meal, okay? Because someone who eats something and it spikes their blood sugar and they come right back down pretty quick is different than someone who they eat something where it spikes their blood sugar and it takes them a long time to come down or someone that eats something and spikes their blood sugar and it spikes multiple times before coming down. Those are all different responses indicating different insulin sensitivities. So um, that's one way to look at it from the diet standpoint. From the exercise standpoint, the readout's the same. Okay, so you're always looking at, you know, you've got your upper limit and you've got your lower limit and you've got your real-time blood sugar over time. So for me, what I've been doing exercise-wise is I go in fasted and I want to see what do different workouts do to my blood sugar. So I found over the last four days that I've been wearing it, I tend to be uh, at baseline or, or fasted. I'm sitting at like 97 on average. And so if I go into the gym fasted, I walk into the gym and I'm, you know, I'm around 97. And if I do a 20 minute workout, um, midway into the workout, I start to spike to the 120s, the 140s, depending on how intense the workout is. And then it'll come down after the workout and then I'll drink my post-workout shake and it'll pop a little bit and come back down. So that's what I've noticed for me. Um, interestingly, I've noticed in the past before I was wearing the CGM that after I do a fasted workout, typically what I do is I go in fasted, I work out. I have my post-workout shake after that has 30 grams of protein in it and 60 grams of carbs. And then usually I don't eat for another two hours after that because, you know, my, my, my schedule, my day is just in the way. And depending on how intense the workout is, sometimes I'll get a headache and it's the headache that's like in my forehead. And then I get those squiggly lines in my peripheral vision. And I know personally all, all along I've suspected, Hey, that's low blood sugar. And so I'll go eat something and within a half hour, it'll take care of itself. But, uh, last, uh, let's see what day is today. Today's Monday. So, uh, I believe it was Friday when I worked out two hours after my workout, I I'd gotten home and I was making breakfast and I literally started having a headache and the squigglies. And right when I started having that, the alarm went off on my blood glucose monitor saying, my blood sugar was too low and I was at 67. Okay. So I was like, well, isn't that interesting? The timing of the onset of symptoms and my blood sugar dropping were literally nearly exactly the same moment. So then I continued making my breakfast, ate it and blood sugar came back up and headache and vision issues went away. So it's really cool to 
uh, see, you know, everyone's worried about too high blood sugar because diabetes is so prevalent, but we also don't want to be too low. Too low is also unhealthy. And exercise is good for us in general, but if we uh, overdo it and don't fuel properly afterwards, you know, we may, like in this case, our blood sugar might go too low and we have symptoms that uh, at the least impact our quality of life in the moment, if not affect us physiologically longer term. So that's uh, some exercise observations for me. Sleep, sleep is interesting. Uh, for me, my sleep's great, thankfully. So I haven't noticed, I've only noticed one thing that impacted my sleep and it was the food I ate and the timing of the food that I ate. So food timing is what impacted my sleep or my blood sugar overnight. And so what I'm talking about is last week, uh, I got late, I got home late one night uh, after taking the kids to sports or something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but we got home and uh, I had a salad and then I helped uh, Kate put the kids to bed. And then probably 40 minutes later, I had a uh, gluten-free pizza and it was about, it was like 947, I believe I can look on my monitor when I ate the pizza. And so I ate the pizza and went to bed, which, you know, that's too late to eat and go to bed, but life got me that night. And so in the morning I looked at it and what the blood sugar looked like was this. So it was up, up up and then down the rest of the night and this was this was between 10 and 4 okay so it took me 6 hours took my body 6 hours to properly return my blood sugar to baseline after eating that pizza um you know at that time too so like and I checked this later on a couple of days later, I ate leftover pizza at lunchtime and it didn't do this. Didn't make these three humps. It just went up and went down and I dealt with it fine. But the three, the three humps here overnight, um, six hours to deal with that pizza is a long time. And if you think about sleep, like, what do I tell you guys? We want to, the best sleep is between 10 to two where our best antiviral killers between like one and three, the most restful and healing parts of sleep are 10 to two. So I, I lost all the, you know, a large part of the benefit of that sleep time that night because I was wasting six hours digesting, you know, dealing with the blood sugar from the pizza that I was, that I had eaten. So I learned my lesson. The next night I came home and I was up late again because uh, I'm coaching my son's like football team. We got home from our first practice. And so I was like, all right, last night I did the uh, gluten-free carb bomb strategy. And I know what that did to me. So tonight I'm going to do chicken only. And uh, my wife had made chicken and nothing else. And she apologized for it. But, you know, it's one of those nights. It is what it is. So she had quartered a chicken and I had all the chicken I, I wanted. So I ate, um, it was a, it was at least 40 grams of just chicken. So it was straight protein and my blood sugar. And the next morning I looked at it and over the whole night, it was this. Okay. So I'd stayed like 97 to 104 the whole night. And so the protein, right, there's no carbs in eating the chicken breast. So there's no carbs to spike my blood sugar. So I didn't have to expend energy on having to deal with these three humps all night as basically what my blood sugar was an afterthought because there was nothing to deal with. So I got those six hours of restful sleep and the body could put energies in to other things that needed um, its focus. So, you know, these are things that are pretty intuitive if, if you know just a little bit about carbs and proteins and how they're handled by the body, but it's cool to see in real time on myself, how do they impact me? And again, seeing this, this triple hump here changed my behavior the very next night to say, instead of eating, you know, carbs and something late, I remembered this and I said, no, I'm going to choose differently. I'm going to change my behavior and changing my behavior had obvious uh, 
better results than than the the pizza eat. So um if that behavior causes someone to make that proper choice day after day over time, you know, the monitor completely changed their their blood sugar handling and their health by improving their sleep, which also probably changed the cognition in their overall life overall. So that was powerful for me to see. And then stress, I uh, I, ha- I don't have an example for you with stress um, that, you know, that is, I, I honestly haven't, I'm pretty low stress. At least I perceive myself as, as low stress. So um, I've been watching it. I have all the data and everything, but I don't have a a specific event and blood sugar correlation to show you in terms of stress relating to it. And so my stressors would, you know, my largest stressor would probably be the exercise, which is a good stress or a you stress, uh, or the pizza would be the next one. But that I snapped that into the sleep example. So I hope you can see this can provide you with a lot of useful information and you can use it to say, um, how should I time my meals? How should I pair my food? So that's another thing I want to look at. Another observation from this week is there's only been one time where I broke through this 180 ceiling. Okay. And it's interesting because what it was, was I was eating uh, gluten-free chips. There's a, there's Aldi has a bag of gluten-free chips that are, um, they're like, I forget what they're called. They're called spicy something. Okay. And so I like those chips with my gluten-free sandwich at lunch. And usually I'll eat the chips while I'm making the sandwiches and then eat the sandwiches. And so I did this the first day that I was wearing the monitor and I'm eating the chips and making my sandwiches and I hear the alarm go off from my monitor. So I look at it and my blood sugar had gone up here and it was at 210. And I was like, wow, okay. So those chips definitely set me off big time. So then my question to myself was, I ate the chips while I was preparing the sandwiches and the chips are just chips, right? So it's carbs and, and uh, sunflower oil or whatever they're they're cooked in. I believe it's sunflower oil for that bag. So my experiment was the next day, okay, I'm going to eat the same meal, but I'm going to do the sandwiches first and then the chips. And when I did that, I never went above 150. So nutrient combining or how you combine your macronutrients is important. And so what the explanation for why I didn't, I went from 210 when I ate the chips first to 150 if I ate the sandwiches first is the sandwiches were turkey sandwiches with literally turkey breast that we cut up ourselves to put on it. So the protein helps blunt the glycemic response of the chips. And so personally, I just, I'm, I'm more moving away from not eating those chips at all, just because of the effect that I saw them have for me. But I, before I got rid of them, I wanted to see, well, okay, interesting. I like to have some crunch with the lunch. So if I eat them, I will do better if I eat the protein first to blunt that glycemic response. So protein and fat will usually uh, blunt the glycemic response of the carbs. So when you're thinking about it, and so will fiber. So eat your fresh fiber first, like uh, the salad before the pizza, or eat your uh, protein and fat before you eat the carbs. Um, or maybe if you eat the chips with guacamole, say, that'd be the next experiment for me to do, is eat it with guacamole and see if the fat from the avocados blunts the glycemic response and allows me to have the chips with a more with a stable blood sugar. Um, so next question might be, okay, this is cool, but where do I get a CGM? And so again, many of them are prescription only. And I've got a pharmacist friend that I've talking to uh, lately who said soon the, he doesn't expect it to be too long until they are uh, taken off the prescription only um, kind of rule and available to everyone. And I think that's how it should be because think about obesity in America, think about the standard American diet and how unhealthy it is. 
think about the prevalence of diabetes and insulin resistance. It's everywhere. You know, project, projections say diabetes itself will bankrupt our country by 2030. Um, so will Alzheimer's, you know, so will multiple chronic diseases. So it's a big problem. So if we are really, uh, I mean, we're really concerned with it, but if the government, if the, if the bodies that say they are concerned with American health were really truly concerned with American health and creating health, then they should make continuous glucose monitors available to everyone and free, right? Um, they can make uh, novel creations that haven't had long-term studies free in just six months of pushing them to market. And those do nothing to make you healthier, whereas a continuous glucose monitor on every person would go a long way in helping America be healthier because as you slam that bottle of Coke, you could see your blood sugar skyrocket and hear your thing beeping at you and say, oh, wow, okay, maybe this isn't a good strategy. Maybe I should eat something else and drink something else. So I'm excited for those to uh, become widely available uh, hopefully inexpensively for the lay public. But until that happens, there are options. So let's jump over to the internet. So here's one example uh, online of a, of a continuous glucose monitor company that you don't need a prescription for. And just full disclosure, I don't get anything from this company. I don't know them. They don't know me other than uh, I know them just from reading their website. But and I have a patient who's used this, but um, this is a way you could get a continuous glucose monitor without being diabetic and without needing the prescription. And so it's just Nutrisense.io is their website, and you can go on and you can subscribe to their program and basically use their continuous glucose monitor and their app to follow uh, whatever you're looking to follow, whether it's weight, whether it's your exercise program, whether it's sleep, um, you know, the continuous glucose monitor, you can you can glean data for for from it for all those issues like I just described to you. So uh, if you want to see their plans, you can check out the website. And again, I don't get anything from them, but essentially it's like two ninety nine a month for three months plan. So you wear it for three months and uh, get all that information for yourself to understand how 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 you live and how your lifestyle, diet, exercise, stress, and sleep impact your blood sugar. And uh, basically what it is is you you each sensor lasts 10 days. So you change out the sensor every 10 days um, and you would wear it for, for as long as you want. So let's open this up for questions. I have a question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I just started wearing one last night, yesterday. Okay. I am having a hard time keeping my blood sugar up. Like it keeps alarming me that I'm in the 50s. And that's not normal because I'm not diabetic and I'm not on insulin. Uh -huh. So I don't know what I need to do differently diet-wise. or And it happens mostly in the evening too. Like from four on every hour, it would tell me. And so I'd eat but it would never bring my blood sugar back up long-term. And so what do you do when you're constantly too low? Um, well, you, first you need to eat, right? But then figuring out what to eat for the individual. Um, so, you know, most people think when it's too low, they want to get carbs in to raise it. And that is true uh, to an extent that you don't want to go too low, but then, carbs are going to make you ping pong, right? So that's where leveraging the fat and the protein comes in because um, fat and protein can be converted to blood sugar by various mechanisms in your body. So you may, when you're low, you know, use the, uh, use the car straight sugar or carbs to get yourself up, but then pairing it with protein and fat meals uh, keeps you that way. And in, in terms of, when the carb stuff runs out, if you're if you're supplying enough protein and fat, the body can work to convert that. And also, it, uh, the protein and fat, like I showed you, helps blunt the glycemic response. So you don't, you know, you'll raise it, but won't necessarily go up and crash back down as much. So, 
uh, maybe looking at how much protein and fat you're getting. Okay. Cause I would, I mean, that's what I had for dinner was I had a salad with avocado and mm -hmm. cucumber and stuff, but then I also had chicken, just almost what you said that you had. And mm -hmm. I still dipped low and couldn't figure out how to keep myself. Above. Yeah, so, so you actually may need more carb in that meal. Okay. Okay. Right. Cause those are, those are good, good choices. If we surveyed everyone on the street and said, Hey, do you think eating a salad and chicken is healthy? Like 99.9% .9 people would say yes. A hundred percent should say yes. Right. <laughs> um, but if, if you are, and again, this is why it's important, right? Cause you might look at yourself or a doctor might look at a patient and say that person uh, has balanced blood sugar. It's not an issue. Right. And then you put this on and you're like, wow, I'm low all the time. Well, no wonder I'm no wonder I'm tired or brain foggy or headaches or lethargic or, you know, low energy or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I eat a good diet. I eat salad and chicken. It's like, yeah, but you still need, you still, you need carbs. You don't necessarily want to be no carb. Right. So um, keep eating those good things, but maybe just add some carbs. Okay. And, and, vegetables some vegetables are better carbs than others right yeah so the starchy veggies are going to be okay more carbs so your you know your uh um uh, squashes and sweet potatoes and okay uh, along those lines and then again you may you may even be fine with a little rice or a little uh uh you know a, a, another carb that is a, a a higher glycemic carb if you're packaging it with chicken and, and, and salad, it may not spike you as much because this will help blunt it. So again, since you've got the machine on, you can look at it and say, all right, I'm going to try a little bit of rice with this meal or sweet potato or whatever you choose. And then you just eat it in whatever order you want, observe what it does to your blood sugar. And if it, if it spikes it, you know, say it sends you up over the, through the ceiling of your limit, then you say, okay, well, what if I eat, the salad and protein first and finish with the rice or sweet potato. Oh, now it didn't send me through the ceiling. It actually brought me to mid range where I thought I was always walking around at. Okay. Right? So it's, it's, we're, we're always quick to blame the food, but it might not be the food. It might just be, you need to combine it with the other macros differently. And if, and, or maybe you, you, you had too much rice at that sitting. So you could play with how much rice was it. And, you know, so there's, there's multiple variables and each body's going to respond to the things differently. So um, that's your homework this week is to figure out, you know, how do I keep myself from going too low, which is the opposite problem of many Americans. Right. And so sure. in our world that, that may be more common though, because people in the functional medicine space are more conscious of blood sugar and eating clean diets and lower carbs and lower grain or whatever. So here's a, you know, here's a, here's a neat case that a healthy diet could still be bothering you from a too low blood sugar standpoint.